Hello. Hi there. Hello again. Hi yeah. Hello. Right. Oh. Here, let me introduce you to Molly. <laughs> so, shall we begin? Yep. Okay. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> I've been working on interactive storytelling for 25 years now, and I noticed, to my great regret, that uh, nobody has used my technology. So nobody has even used any of the components of my technology. Nobody has stolen or plagiarized anything, and I've been trying to give it away. So uh, came up with a bright idea. I thought maybe it's too complicated. My technology is very complicated. So. I thought, what if I reduce it to its absolute simplest form? And I started working on that uh, in January. Uh, the idea was to build an encounter editor, which would allow people to build what I call an encounter, which is the simplest possible form of interactive storytelling. And I worked for six months on making the encounter editor really easy to use. And I also made those three videos that you watched. And I put a lot of work into making those nice and clean. And in early June, I released the whole thing to the world and said, here it is, go for it, everybody. And nobody even tried. <laughs> I didn't get one person who actually built an encounter and I only got two emails back from people asking questions. So this was rather demoralizing because, you know, I, I thought, well, you know, maybe <laughs> nobody's ever going to be able to use my technology because they don't understand it. So I did an awful lot of thinking about, you know, what is wrong here. And there's an idea that's been developing in my head for years now, but this really brought it home to me. And the idea is that I think differently than most people. I have a very different way of thinking about the world, and this makes interactive storytelling obvious and simple to me, but impossible to other people. So let me explain that form of thinking, because that's the most important thing I can do for you today. Uh, and the question, we start with the question, what is reality? Now, there are two way, there are many answers, but there are two interesting answers to it that combine in an interesting way. The first answer is reality is a collection of objects. The second uh, answer is reality is a system of processes. Now, this distinction shows up everywhere. For example, in physics, we have the two fundamental components of the universe are particles and waves. Particles are objects. Waves are processes. In uh, economics, we, the two fundamental components of any economy are goods and services. Goods are objects. Services are processes. In uh, linguistics, the two fundamental components of every language are nouns and verbs. Uh, and nouns describe objects and verbs describe processes. In mathematics, we have numbers and operations. In computer science, we have data and algorithms. In uh, computer hardware, we have RAM and the CPU. Over and over again, we see this basic polarity between object and process. Now, the first I'll mention that they mix together. They sort of, you can actually mix them in all sorts of interesting ways. For example, in physics, we talk about wavicles. They some, if you, if you study this thing, if you observe it as if it were a particle, it acts like a particle. But if you observe it as if it were a wave, it acts like a wave. So which is it, particle or wave? Well, both. Or in economics, suppose you go to your favorite restaurant, McDonald's, and you <laughs> buy yourself a Big Mac. What are you paying for? Are you spending your money to purchase two all-beef patty special sauce, lettuce, pickle, onion, or a sesame seed bun? Or 
Are you paying for the services of the person who takes your money, the person who cooks the food, the truck driver who brings the food to the restaurant, the, the farmer who grows the food? Are you buying a good or a service, an object or a process? Uh, well, sort of both. So we can look at things through two different lenses. We can see them as objects or we can see them as processes. But here's the pro. Oh, I, I first have to mention an important thing here. What is the most important part of a computer? That is, if you had to point to the heart of the computer, what would you point to? Well, you better answer CPU, because the central processing unit is indeed the very heart of a computer. And notice that it's called the central processing unit. That's because its job is to process. And so, aha, if we think in terms of objects and processes, the computer is clearly on this side. Now, of course, you can't have a program without data as Donald Knuth wrote in, in entitled his uh, classic book on programming, uh, data plus algorithms equals programming. So yeah, you gotta have data, but the heart of the computer is the processing. That's the one thing that computers do that nothing else does. I mean, if you wanna present text, you know, you can, you can use a book. If you wanna present uh, images, you can use a book or all sorts of different things. If you want animation, you got cinema, the movies. That's a great way to do it. But none of those things can process. The computer's strength is its ability to process, not its ability to show images, not its ability to do animation, not its ability to do text or sound or music. What makes the computer special, unique, is its ability to process. And that means that if you want to be a good designer, you have to focus on processing. And here you face a problem because your mind is biased to think in terms of objects, not processes. For example, in the English language, I don't, I don't know the numbers for French, but in English, if you take the 1,000 most commonly used English words, You'll find that about a hundred of them are, you know, housekeeping verbs, prepositions and articles and such. 600 of those most commonly used words are nouns or the adjectives that describe them. 300 are verbs or the adverbs that describe them. In other words, we have twice as many words for objects as we do for processes. That reflects, and I'm sure French is very similar, that reflects the bias in our minds towards objects. The reason for that bias has to do with the primary way we learn about the universe, our eyes. The eyes are, I mean, you use your eyes for almost everything you learn. And eyes can't see processes, they can only see objects. And so you see the world automatically as a collection of objects, not a system of processes. That makes you biased. And that also makes you unfit for use it for designing things on the computer. Now, I'm not saying that you can't think in terms of processes. Obviously, you do. You can write programs. Everybody has some ability to think in terms of processes. But the great majority of people think far more in terms of objects than processes. And the odds are you are similar. And so you need to think about how you can increase your comprehension of processes. And that is difficult because, well, most people haven't learned much about processes. The way you learn about processes, you never ask, what is that? because all the, the only answer is to give you the name of an object. Instead, you ask, how does that work? And you want to understand how everything works. And it is absolutely fascinating. The, uh, uh, here, I gotta show you my example. I just got this. 
for the big eclipse a month ago, I went up to a, a mountain in, in Oregon. It's very distant from anything else. And I went searching for rocks because I like rocks. And I found this rock right here. Now, by some wild coincidence, a professional geologist was standing about 10 meters away from me. Here we are in empty Oregon, and here's a professional geologist, and he explained what this is. This thing is really great. This is a lot more interesting than anything else. Now, if you look, you'll see it has all these layers, and layers normally mean a sedimentary rock, you know, dirt in water, rocks in water, <laughs> settling down, linking layers, and so forth, but this is not sedimentary. And so I was trying to figure it out and he explained it to me. This is the result of a pyroclastic flow. This is really neat. Uh, pyroclastic flow, you know how when a volcano erupts, it sends a lot of stuff shooting way up into the air, but sometimes it also shoots out a gray black cloud that's heavy and starts rolling down the slopes of the volcano. And that cloud is composed of fine powder, little rocks, big rocks, gases, and it's extremely uh, heavy. And so it falls very quickly. It's much heavier than air. And so because it's so heavy, when it hits trees, it just knocks them down. And of course, when it hits people, it kills them like that. That's what destroyed uh, Pompeii. That's what destroyed uh, the town of San Martin on the island of Martinique in 1902. These things are really deadly. They are the worst natural phenomena you could ever experience. And they can move at up to 300 miles an hour, too. So they're bad news, but they're also really exciting from the <laughs> geologist's point of view. This is the product of a pyroclastic flow. I won't go into all the geological details, but basically as the thing goes down a slope, it lays down a layer of ash and that cools, and then another layer of ash forms on top, and then another, and another, and another, and because it's so hot, the ash welds together. It melts into a solid, which is really neat. And the other really neat thing about this is that you can see, if, I'm not sure if you can see it here, but there are these little flat bubbles. Are they visible in this? Yeah. Those came from carbon dioxide that was in the gases and got trapped when the ash laid down and then squished flat by the weight of the thing. This is really neat stuff. I find this to be much nicer rock than a diamond or a ruby or an emerald. Those are crystals. I've seen lots of crystals before, but this... This is unique, and it's unique not because of how it looks, but because how it was formed. That's what makes it so fascinating. And that's the idea that you need to learn, thinking about how everything works. Now, I've been doing this, I mean, I graduated from college 45 years ago. And so I've been doing it for a long time, and I've learned an awful lot, and you're going to have to do the same thing. Uh, so you might as well get started. I will mention, basically, you want to know how everything works. Electricity, you're going to have to learn a lot of physics. Uh, you know, why do, why do planets orbit the sun, all of that stuff. Uh, uh, but also, there are lots of non-physics things you can do, like evolution. The way evolution works and the fine details are really fascinating. There are bugs in the Amazon the males actually end up killing themselves. It's complicated, but basically, it's how they reproduce. Uh, <laughs> there are all, all sorts of weird things in evolution, and they explain there are all these weird behaviors in the animal world, and when you think of them in terms of evolution, they make sense. Um, oh, history, that's a process that deserves study, and it teaches you a great deal. Uh, the French Revolution was one of the most obvious things in the world, in the sense any idiot could see what was coming, except, of course, the French monarchy. But <laughs> <laughs> any historian looking at that situation would say, they're going to chop off their heads any day now. 
Um, there are all sorts of things in history that if you understand the processes of history, it makes a lot more sense. The brain, now there, that's the most complicated system in the universe. Understanding how the brain works is really neat. Figure out neurons and uh, all of that stuff. Mental modules, the, the way the brain is organized and how people think. That's also a really, ooh, that looks good. Uh, no, I can't help it. Oh, anyway. <laughs> anyway, uh, so you want to learn all of this stuff. And uh, it will take you a long, 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 long time. I will, here's a book that I recommend, The Way Things Work. It's a little old, but it's really neat because this guy explains everything. And he has all of these great pictures to show how it works. This is what? Steam engines, internal combustion engines, transistors, uh, pumps, uh, gears, you know, everything. It's, it's really a great book. It's loads of fun. And it will get you thinking along the right, uh, along the, uh, in the right way. Uh, oh, here's another example. Actually, this isn't an example. If you look at this, this is an English crown uh, minted in 1662. And what's striking about this is that the edge is plain. I'm not sure if you can see this, but most coins, if you look at them, have ridges along the edges. Why do they have ridges? Because uh, they, uh, there were counterfeiters who would take a slug of iron and then coat it with a little bit of silver and then pass it off as the real thing. And Isaac Newton, just after this was uh, made, about 10 years, Isaac Newton was appointed to be the exchequer of the mint. He was responsible for coins and therefore responsible for getting rid of the counterfeits. And he realized that if you put ridges along the edges, then if it's a fake coin, you can just go on anything sharp like that, rub it, and the fake would show through. And that for years and years, that's how all coins were made. And nowadays, all the coins are counterfeit anyway. That is, they're not made of gold or silver, so they don't need to have ridged edges anymore. Anyway, I've talked too long about this. Uh, there's one other thing, though. Now's where we get into the ugly part. If you want to understand processes, you have to be able to express yourself in the language of processes. And that language is not C or C++ or Pascal, Fortran, uh, Java, JavaScript. Those aren't really languages of process. The intrinsic language of process is mathematics. <laughs> because math describes how processes work. And that means if you want to be able to program processes, design algorithms using processes, you gotta be able to speak math. Now, I'm not talking about higher level math and calculus, differential equations, matrices, all of that stuff, you don't need that. Uh, mostly what you need is basic algebra, simple geometry, maybe trigonometry. That's about as high as you need to go. If you can master those things and use them, not just pass a test about them, but actually bring them into your design process, you're going to be way ahead of everybody else. The math I use in my designs is really simple stuff, but uh, it, it's what makes my stuff so, in everybody else's eyes, so complicated. So, you're going to have to uh, really not just not learn math, but go back and start trying to use the math you've learned. So, that's my quickie summary of my advice to you. If you want to be a good designer, you really must learn about all the processes you can because there's so many different kinds of processes and you have to learn the math to express them. So with that, I'm just, no, I'm gonna say one other point that's really important for you. Uh, you may have noticed that after all these years, games are still 
not really used by the bulk of the population. Now, I'm sure you've seen the surveys that say 80, 83% of all people play games. And, you know, here's a nun who's a, a top scorer in Halo or something like that. But I mean, just think about the people you know who aren't gamers like you. There are a lot of them, and there are a lot of them who just don't play games. That's the truth. And why, in fact, if you think about it, most of the people who are really avid about playing games are guys. In fact, if you look around, you will see how many women are in that room with you. That's a, uh, what, three or four? That's, you know, I think that pretty well shows. This is very much a male activity. Why? The answer has to do with mental modules, the way the human brain is organized. And there are, it, the brain is not just a calculator or a computer. It's got specialized ways of dealing with specialized things. One of those specialties is spatial reasoning, the ability to imagine a map and how you would navigate from here to there. Every game has a map. Why? Because spatial reasoning is a male specialty. Men are particularly good at it. Women aren't so good at it. I mean, they, they can do it very well, but men have the edge, and men really enjoy using that type of reasoning. So they love that type of thing. Of course, the violence helps, too. But the big thing that the games industry is missing out on is social reasoning. This is a major part of the human brain in in women and a fairly big part of the human brain in males and a very small part in most programmers, as you have probably noticed that most programmers aren't that good at interpersonal relationships. So uh, social reasoning is really important because if you want to get women to play your games, you've got to challenge their social reasoning, not their ability to figure out a map. Uh, think about the entertainment industry. How many movies are exactly like uh, a video game? Very few. In fact, when you look at movies that were made from video games, the big change they make is that they add personality to it. For example, Angry Birds, I never saw the movie, but I read some reviews of it, and the difference between Angry Birds the movie and Angry Birds the game is that in the movie, the birds have personalities. They, have, they talk to each other and argue and they get mad and, and so forth. It's the social interactions that are in the movie and aren't in the game. Uh, in fact, most movies are entirely about social interaction. Uh, there are lots of movies with nothing but social interaction. They're called chick flicks, and they're for women, and they're about people getting into complicated you know, situations. Uh, uh, the English author, uh, uh, good one, Jane Austen, wrote these books that are immensely popular with women. Men don't like them very much, uh, but they are still popular with women, and they're about nothing more than people talking to each other. In fact, in most movies, most of these people spend a lot more time talking than shooting. So we need a lot more of that. And to do that, you've got to develop your concepts of social reasoning. Unfortunately, social re reasoning is a lot harder to handle than shooting guns. Shooting guns, all you got to do is figure out a trajectory and maybe it drops a little due to gravity and then physical effects of impact and, you know, trivial. But <laughs> social stuff, you got to have algorithms for how people feel. Now, that's a tricky business. In fact, I'm going to suggest something you were suggesting earlier, uh, a possibility of a game jam. I'll give you a challenge. Imagine the following situation. Three people. Uh, Joe, Tom, and Mary. Two guys, one gal. Now, Joe hits Tom. How does Mary react? Well, that's going to depend on how Mary feels about Joe and how Mary feels about Tom. 
She might say, yeah, punch that bastard in the nose. Or she might say, oh, no, you bad person. Write algorithms based on how much she likes or dis not just bullying. Yes, she likes him. No, she doesn't. Uh, that, there's too much bullying stuff. Uh, instead, have numbers that say she likes him this much, she dislikes him this much, and then have uh, those numbers and write an algorithm for how she's going to react. Uh, and then, once you've got that, now see if it works for Joe does something really nice to Tom. He gives him his car or whatever. Uh, how would she react then? So that's, that's a challenge. This is the simplest possible social interaction you can imagine. And it really should be trivially easy for you guys to do that. And if it is, then come up with more complexities. Uh, there are a lot of things you can do. But I better shut up and give you a chance to ask questions now. So, did any of you understand any of what I said? <laughs> I just want to add. I was afraid of that. <laughs> Challenge accepted. <laughs> yeah, just, oh, I think oh, fuck. Just, keep, just keep it like that. Keep it yeah? Like that. yeah. I don't want to turn it. Do you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Challenge accepted. Okay. <laughs> cool. Uh, Is who you... wants to ask questions? Yeah. Just someone. That's you can nice. just come forward and talk into the microphone. Yeah. Okay. That way he can see who's talking. Hi. <laughs> nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Yeah, thanks for your talk. Yeah, except that uh, I'm a researcher in video games, and I really don't understand why a women's brain would be different from males. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, well, first, it's not so much the brain as it's a combination of factors. There is a genetic component, but that, that turns out to be fairly small. What really happens is that our culture amplifies that difference tremendously. Little girls play with dolls. Little boys don't. What do you learn about social reasoning from that experience? Uh, you know, little boys uh, do a lot more stuff involving physical violence and moving around strategically. Our cultures really boost that, and so. Uh, I mean, in behavioral terms, it's very well established that there are major differences in the way men and women think. The problem is that a lot of this is cultural, and in some cultures, those differences don't exist. It's, it's just in our culture. But not only cultural, it's social. It's just because uh, male are in the society where they're dominant, and so they don't have to ask as many questions and feel the same way as a woman. And yep. then that's not something that uh, you should put forward into reasoning when creating a video game. Like, uh, I don't think that's arguing for creating video games for women uh, as a, an economic and commercial argument is good. Like, mm. uh, that's just, if you want to create a video game that is about feelings, that is about your relationship with an, any other people, that's not because you're going to want to make women play video games. If they don't play video games, that's for many other reasons. And I'm not the one who doesn't play video games, so just <laughs> speaking this way is just um, putting me apart from every other people and making me just like feel bad for being a woman. <laughs> and <laughs> I don't want that, and that's not why I came here. Uh, that's not at all what I'm suggesting. The, uh, uh, the way I'm thinking of it is the games industry has failed. Not that many women play games. This is a failure, a problem that needs to be addressed. So uh, if, we, if we want to solve that problem, we've got to look at where the problem exists. And I think one of the factors, I think a very large factor, is the lack of social reasoning. If you look at our entertainment, how many movies are fundamentally about the relationships between people? And how many are fundamentally about shooting things? Uh, the or, or logic problems, the the social relationships dominate movies and fiction and poetry and so forth. Uh, we humans are really interested in how we get along with each other, especially women, because 
that's more important to their personal success in our culture. Um, no, I don't think you. Should. There's a need really like to to put forward like. Women are more like that, and it's more for women. Like when yeah. you say, like movies about talking is more for women. That's just really. Uh, yeah, maybe it's more more like a business way of thinking, like an easy thing. Like, yeah, if we draw a big model and we draw a big round and we say, women's like that, men's like that, and like what is easy put money into and to say where well, if we make a game with a lot of shooting inside we know that there will be 60% of the population will, will, that will be playing this game. Yeah, and we are here with one of the most eminent thinkers about, <laughs> we are here with one of the most eminent thinkers of video games and so that's not, we're not here just to put forward like uh, very big cases, uh, places where we put all people together and stuff. I think. Maybe there has okay. to be more than that. You're like really initiated so much about video games and you're one of the first uh, thinkers that I read. And I was so shocked to hear you talking <laughs> earlier, really, because just let because me, I admire you so much. Let me put it to you in my own terms. The argument I gave you is the argument that works with Americans. And I should have realized you're not American. <laughs> thing is uh, my motivation is art. Yeah. How many great works of art have been made about shooting and killing people? How many great works of art have been made about social relationships? Well, it's lopsided. I mean, all art is fund fundamentally about the human condition, not shooting or killing or moving around on a map. And so if we want to do art, we've got to bring in things that are more closely related to the human condition. And one of the most important is the relationships we have with each other. That's why I'm in it. Uh, I really, really would like to see a game that is genuinely artistic in style. I'll give you an example of how hard this can be once we get these ideas burned into our brain. I, uh, I'm trying to do a story world based on the Arthurian legends, King Arthur. Because those legends, really, they're very complex and they go back thousands of years. And the earliest versions are quite deep, actually. But uh, I thought I would start off doing just one little part of it. And I decided I would do a battle. Now that may sound like, ah, all wrong. But I had this idea, let's do a battle from an interpersonal point of view. In other words, We don't worry about who's swinging swords and who's killing whom and so forth. The whole thing is you're King Arthur and your people are out there and they're scared and some of them are getting hurt and some of them are dying and you've got to say and do the right things to keep their morale up. You've got to help them out or some of them you have to threaten, get back out there and keep on fighting. And other people you say, don't worry, I'll help. It depends on the personalities. That has been really hard for me to do because I'm an old war game designer and I keep putting in these war game things and I have to keep slapping my no, no. <laughs> It's hard. But that, I mean, isn't that what, that isn't artistic success what you really, really want? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, but in this way, yes, but you, like, didn't have to use the other <laughs> arguments. Yeah. Okay, it's, it's if you want artistic success, you've got to, uh, uh, you're not going to get it through maps and guns and bullets and magic spells. You're going to get it through people's relationships with each other. And I warn you, this is immensely difficult to model. You'll need a personality model, which describes the basic characteristics. Don't use the standard one from psychology, the ocean model. Uh, that describes real people, and real people are boring. <laughs> Characters in stories who do things you would never do. I mean, seriously, how many of you would have really taken the red pill? <laughs>
<laughs> anyway, uh, it's hard. The other killer problem is language. People interact through language. And you cannot have any kind of decent interpersonal interaction without language. And yet, we can't do language with a computer. Not very well. And so what you need is what I call a toy language. And the language has to be tied directly to the algorithms. That is, each word in the language has to have a whole bunch of algorithms sitting behind it. And you have to design all those algorithms. Mm -hmm. I should let somebody else ask a question. Or do you yeah. have any more questions? No, no, it's fine. Yeah. Hi, hello. Uh, nice to meet you. Uh, I think I agree with the immensely difficulty of designing a system that will uh, answer to you and uh, feel natural. You know. um, I have the feeling that the, the system that you designed is actually um, creating the right answer, but maybe uh, I feel like the difficulty is also standing in the way that you as a player interact with the computer and how you pass the information because it's the first step of communication and if you can't express yourself properly then uh, the feedback is whatever is the feedback then it's not uh, properly yeah. felt. Um, I had this feeling that one game that succeeded quite well recently was Even Zero that you're discussing with Naya AI. Uh, and the success might have been because you're just typing directly the sentence as you could discuss with anyone. So when I came into the game, the first thing I'm saying is, hi, how are you? What, what are you doing? Uh, what's your name? Just typing it, the whole sentence. And the system is getting just a few keywords but that you don't know as a player. Um, so what I'm saying is I feel like the biggest difficulty after master, masterizing your system is designing the interaction system with the computer. Yeah, and the language, the interactions are defined by the language that you can give the user. And that in turn is very difficult. What type of, uh, I always say, what are the verbs? That defines the software. What verbs are available to the user? If you want to have, I mean, wouldn't it be nice to have a game where one of the verbs is hug? or kiss, or hold hands, wouldn't that be a really interesting game? But we can't do that yet, because in order to do that, I mean, just kiss. Think about all of the social implications of kiss. What conditions are required to permit a kiss? What conditions would forbid a kiss? <laughs> We're getting very complicated here. Uh, and again, don't use Boolean values. Don't say, <laughs> he likes her, he doesn't like her. You know, that, what that produces is the player approaches, there's this beautiful woman, the player approaches a beautiful woman and tries various things, she slaps him in the face, and then he does something, she slaps him in the face. He does something else, she slaps him in the face, and then he does the right thing, and she jumps in bed with him. <laughs> That's not how people work. So, you know, no black and white. It's all gray. I'd like to uh, point out uh, another thing. You have to put yourself inside the mind of your user. You have to think, what is the player thinking? And that's really hard to do, because the player is not the same person you are. In fact, if the player is the same person, similar, too much like you, all they're going to be doing is criticizing your design because they're a game designer too. So you need to appeal to people who aren't like you. And that requires some hard thinking. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Oh. Uh, hi, Chris. Hi. Uh, we met a few years ago. I had, I had less of a beard. Um, you probably don't remember. Um, I, I wanted to ask, um, uh, I, I was going to say actually, just parentheses with regard to the hug and kiss example, there's actually the Sims. So I guess that's a, probably quite a terrible example of what we're talking about. Um, yeah. 
I don't blame them. I mean, that was, I was just, they, we knew very little back then. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I wanted to ask whether, I mean, recently there have been, with this sort of whole indie bubble thing, which is, feels like it's sort of coming to a close in a certain sense. There've been a lot of experimentation. We had Event Zero that was mentioned just now as well. Um, have there been any games recently that you would say have been a step in the right direction? Do you have any examples of things that have not disappointed you too much? Um, no, don't. And the reason why is, I, I'm sure you'll be disappointed to learn, I just will not play any games anymore. And there are two reasons. The first is based on a quote from the American General George S. Patton. And he said, the point in war is not to die for your country, it's to make the other guy die for his country. And I would argue that the point of being a good game designer is not to play other people's games, but to make games so good they have to play your games. So, uh, I really, now of course you can learn a lot from other people, but I've been looking, I mean, I've been playing games for, well, I started about 50 years ago, and I played a lot of thousands and thousands of games. And starting around uh, 15 years ago, people would, I stopped playing games myself, and I would just rely on people recommending. Someone would write and say, you've got to see this game, Chris, it's interesting. And so I'd go look at it, and I'd spend time with it. You can't just look at it. And I said, oh, geez, this is just a combination of that game from 1982 and this game from 1987, that game from 1994, and a little bit of this from 1998. And I said, there's nothing new here. And that happened over and over and over. I have not seen... I went through a long period where I just didn't see anything new. And so I finally just gave up and said, I'm not going to waste my time with this anymore. Now, maybe there has been something radically new. Um, I occasionally will read news stories. I, I figure if something is really great, I'll, I'll see it on the news. And occasionally, I will even follow up on these news stories and read about the game. And... Just reading that, I see there's nothing here that looks new to me. So, so I've just given up on it. Now, maybe it's because I've just got too much experience with it or whatever. But uh, I mean, look around in this room. What is the average age of the people in this room? What? 30? Uh, you know, I'm 67. How many 67-year-old game designers do you know? How many 50-year-old game designers? But uh, a lot of game designers get out of the business by the time they're 40 because they're bored. So, I, I mean, I, I will, sorry, as a follow-up question, I, I, I feel that no discussion of, of, um, of uh, interactive storytelling, you know, it's a legal obligation that someone mentions facade at some point. Um, <laughs> you know, you absolutely, it's the one you have to mention each time. So I'm not sure I have on record your opinions on facade. Would you say, oh. yes, no, you, you know, have you, have you seen, yeah. have you seen that game? Oh, oh yeah. Um. I consider Facade to be the first genuine interactive story world. The, the uh, God, I can't remember their names. Those two guys are the Wright brothers of interactive storytelling. They're the first one to get something actually flying. Unfortunately, it was rather like the Wright brothers' airplane. Not very practical, but that wasn't the point. The point was to demonstrate what could be done. Unfortunately, the method they used involved an enormous amount of tedious labor, didn't use brilliant algorithms, although there were some brilliant algorithms in it, but the success of it wasn't based on the brilliant algorithms. They really didn't have algorithms that calculated a lot about feelings. And so I, I think this is a, a milestone in the history of the technology 
Um, unfortunately, it's also a dead end. We can learn an awful lot from it. Okay. Well, thanks very much. Okay. Um, is there someone? Yeah. Hi. Um, I was wondering if you had a chance to, to get an interest in live-action role-playing games. I know in North America it's a bit sad because it's mostly about fighting and quests and... But in um, Sweden, Norway or Finland for instance and Denmark also, uh, they use that kind of live-action role-playing games to create something about interpersonal relationships which may be of interest in order to create uh, video games uh, inspired by what they did in LARPs. So did, yeah. did you check about what they do? Uh, I played my first live-action role-playing game in 1980. It was also my last playing of a live-action <laughs> role-playing game. I, I went there because I was interested in the design concepts. I read some of the rule books first. This was research on my part. I read some of the rule books. There were a number of them back then. And then I went, a friend of mine was a member, and I went with him, and I don't think I actually played. I spent most of the time watching them play. And then I, I felt like, okay, I understand how this works. What I was interested in in particular are what parts of this process could be computerized. And uh, I concluded that there was the most important things are what the DM does and the dungeon master. And the things he does that really make it come alive are completely beyond what a computer can do, even now. So, yeah, I agree that the live action ones are far superior to anything that a computer can do. Uh, but at the same time, they aren't. Uh, they don't move in a direction that uh, I think is valuable. I think it would be very interesting to get some people together to do a live-action Jane Austen story world, where it's role-playing. Only you're playing as one of the, you know, as one of the various characters in one of the books. That would be very interesting. Thank you. <laughs> I don't see waves of excitement. <laughs> <laughs> Probably already exists somewhere. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I would expect that too, but I've never heard of it. I don't know. Hi. Hi. Um, so, uh, I was listening to what what you were saying, and it uh, yeah. F first, thank you. It's uh, it's really useful. Uh, it helped me uh, put a lot of words on uh, on this idea that uh, I'm a game designer, and like it said that design is about how it's work and not how it looks and um, kind of stuff. And so, thank you for that. But um, I have this thing, this process during what what you're saying, like. Uh, we talked about uh, brain plasticity and like because plasticity is like really the, the thing I, uh, I thought is the most wonderful about the brain actually and how we can be shaped by social dynamic actually because we had this argument before like actually yeah sure genetic plays a role but we, we realize that most of the things we, we think are true and how we shape realities actually um, or people around us or social circle put meanings into our first experience. And I was thinking, you say like you want video games to be about art. That's something you said. And you're talking um, a lot about art science, mathematics, physics, geology. And um, uh, there, are, there are actually science of process, but there are process of um, oh yeah, evolution could be like biology about living thing, but 
it's mostly about dead things or forces we we don't shape. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and actually, like what makes art, I think, but just my opinion, my two cents on it is like it's because it it is about human, uh, about people, about social dynamics. That's what you're trying to do. Like uh, interactive narration is like. Just about how people process one another. Um, so I'm I'm thinking, why are you talking so much about art science? Is it because actually currently video games are uh, is an engineer field, or is it because you never thought like uh, so, uh, uh, social studies can 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 be used for uh, something like that? Okay. Here's a, a way to answer that. I suggest that you Google the phrase uh, algorithms for interpersonal relationships. Okay, thank you. And you'll probably not come up with any hits, or any hits you get will not be about algorithms for interpersonal relationships. You won't find any books about that. The closest you'll come to that is my books and my work. The reason being, nobody has done it yet. That's your job now. You yeah. have to invent it. You know, I've I've carried the ball as far as I can, and I've made a lot of progress. But I want to see other people pushing further in different directions. Now, how are you going to learn? This is really difficult. What I'm saying is. The child, the, the little step that a child makes is learning the physics stuff and the geology stuff. That's how you just get started and learn the really basic stuff. Once you've got that, if you can combine that with your artistic sensibility, then you can make good algorithms. I will tell you, algorithms for interpersonal relationships are fundamentally artistic, not scientific. That is... You have to ask yourself, how would Luke Skywalker react to this? What would uh, Princess Leia think about it? Or Han Solo? How do different people react to this kind of situation? And then you have to write algorithms that say, well, if he's a very idealistic and naive person, he'll do this. And now you got to write what is idealistic, uh, idealistic and naive? How do I calculate a number for that? And then you have to say if he's very cynical and hates people, then there's a different algorithm. And how do you, you need numbers for cynicism and hating people? And how do you combine those? Do you add them or multiply them? Or what do you do here? That's the job. And that's really hard. And right now, none of you can do that. But I suggest you start off with the really, the kids stuff, you know, algorithms from physics and, and other sciences, and then start developing your skills with interpersonal algorithms. Again, you'll find the, the little challenge I gave you for the jam uh, to be, uh, it, you'll be surprised at how different the results, if people work differently, they'll come up with very different results. That is partially an expression of the artistic differences. Thanks. Okay. So, hello. Hello. Ah, so, you said, and rightly so, that the characters in the fiction are not like genuine reality, like human beings, so that they yes. have. They have in order to be entrancing people and do enthralling and interesting in terms of fiction. So my question is based on what you described for the algorithms for inter interpersonal relationships is, do you expect the narration to kind of spontaneously emerge from these algorithms and their interaction with each other? Or do you think that you need some kind of pre-planned possibilities of fiction that will be processed by these algorithms? Here we get into one of the most interesting parallels. Uh, if you talk to professional story authors, people who write novels and screenplays and so forth, they will tell you that there are two basic types of storytellers, plot-driven storytellers and character-driven storytellers. The plot-driven storytellers come up 
with a really intricate plot with all sorts of fascinating little twists and turns where, oh, wow, I never thought I'd do that, and so forth, and it comes up, and, you know, the end of the story is very surprising. Character-driven authors, instead, they start off by imagining what would be a good group of people that would, you know, with different personalities who would interact with each other in interesting ways. And you would, and that type of author then just sits down and says, once upon a time there were these eight people and all these things happened. A beautiful example of that, uh, in fact, soap operas are the purest form of that. Soap operas have no plot whatsoever. They're just a bunch of people interacting with each other. And it just goes on for years and years and years with no real plot. Um, in fact, a lot of very successful, this tends to work best with long stories. For example, television shows that have many episodes. Uh, that's, uh, uh, those tend to be character driven. Uh, the plot driven things tend to be one shot. Uh, isn't this a clever little plot? Didn't you think? What do you think of that? Uh, but it's not as if one is better than the other. They're just two completely different approaches. Now we've seen exactly the same thing with interactive storytelling. Some people have tried to do a plot-driven approach. Some people have tried to do a character-driven approach. I emphasize the character-driven approach because I think. I want to focus on the interactions among people, not the external events. Uh, basically, neither side has succeeded yet. Yes. But the plot-driven people, I think, have they're not as successful as the character-driven. For example, uh, uh, the uh, boy, I'm getting old and forgetting everything. Facade. Yeah. is uh, primarily a character-driven story. So I think this is the better way to approach it for now. In my technology, I actually have a system for putting in something kind of like a plot. It's called plot point system. But of course, <laughs> that's way up high in the technology and people aren't even at the first floor. So uh, that won't be used. So one, one thing is from my understanding of them, it would seem, from an outsider's point of view, let's say, it would seem at first glance that if you infer the plots, then necessarily the interaction level will be lesser than if you let the characters unfold this, the story and create this, this, their own interactions together through their own combination, let's say. Yeah, actually the killer problem with plot is damn user. Hmm. How do you know he's going to go along with your plot? You know, what if what if Luke Skywalker says, "Look, old man, I'm not going with you anywhere." Well, that's the end of that story. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, when you have these plot problems, they come up with all these ridiculous ways of forcing you. The uh, typically they'll just kill you off if you don't play along. Yeah. Uh, they say, "Okay, Luke." You didn't go with what's his name to Moss Eisley. You go home and the stormtroopers kill you. Start over. Yeah. And you just keep getting killed until you do what you're supposed to do. Hmm. So that doesn't work very well at all. So if I may just one last one? Yeah. yeah. So if we focus on the character's drive to push the to, to make the story emerge, or at least let's say the emotion of the narration be happening. Then this one possible way I found from the role-playing games, and especially the tabletop, I mean role-playing games, and especially the indies one, and the indie field of role-playing games, the one way to do it is to uh, hook the characters with, each, with one another. So if you have a tie, let's say, if I have a love interest with you, and you have a love interest with Jesse here, and Jesse hates me, uh, but I love Jesse's girlfriend, and from that, and you have just by just one, two kickers like that, then you kind of embed the plots within the, the character psychology so that they might oh, yeah. have a... Oh, oh yeah, yeah. The, I mean, this is absolutely necessary even in a character-driven story world because you, you can't just say, all right, I'm going to have a character named Pierre. Yeah. That's all there is. Yeah. No, you've got yeah. to specify 
how nice is Pierre? How trusting is Pierre? How how uh, easily does he get angry? And you got to specify all the numbers that might end up getting 